Great. Uh, th thank you, uh, both Neil and uh, David. Uh, excellent uh, points. That, uh, uh, I think that uh, you're right. You know what? Uh, I, I, for the last five, six years, there seems to be more misstanding between the two countries, and I think we, we all need to really work hard to <laughs> to really uh, to 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 get a dialogue, get a communication, and get the right understanding. Exactly like what we're uh, we're doing uh, tonight uh, as well. And uh, I, I think that uh, trade uh, is absolutely so obvious uh, that uh, you know since the Second World War, the trade boom has actually uh, gave the perspective to the world and actually prevented the Third World War. And uh, we, we are still living in largely peace and prosperity because of the trade. And, uh, and this is actually a competitive advantage you talk about, you know, that uh, David Ricardo's uh, theory that, uh, you know, the country does best that maybe we should exchange. And, and the U.S. has many areas, technology, <laughs> uh, you know, U.S. financial uh, power and uh, uh, dominance in the, in, the, in, the, in the internet and many areas. So, so, so China has been doing well in, in infrastructure and also and many other. I, I see a lot of collaboration there. Uh, but just unfortunately now we're, we're actually, you know, we're facing, the whole world is facing a, a huge challenge. We've been, uh, uh, you know, in this uh, pandemic, this COVID-19, uh, now <laughs> we're getting probably COVID-2012 now, it's, it's really still uh, you know, cutting us off, uh, at least uh, uh, for travel. So, so what do you think that we should really work together on, on this? Because I, I see this as a biggest opportunities. Like we, I was talking, talking to Susan uh, Sant and the former assistant deputy secretary of the US. She was saying, you know, look, I mean, the COVID-19 could be the best occasion uh, for the US and China to, to, to let bygone be bygone. Let's, let's concentrate on this common threat enemy number one to the human kind, rather than we have actually, uh, now because of COVID-19, we have actually divided even more so. Uh, I mean, you have this origin of tracing and the blaming of, on China, but also uh, there is, uh, we see, uh, uh, you know, uh, finger pointing uh, as well. And uh, how do you think that we can uh, fight this uh, uh, pandemic? And uh, uh, how can we revive the, uh, uh, you know, the, the, the world travel, how WHO can really work together. You know, I mean, US now is, is maybe lifting some of the lockdown, but then we have, you, have the, you have some surge again in, in some area. But, you know, what, what's the experience US has and, and China has, maybe we can really work together, vaccine recognition, uh, you know, travel kind of exchanges. And now we see that uh, US just, uh, uh, according to the US embassy here, uh, in the last three months, from May, June, and July, U.S. Embassy has issued uh, uh, almost 80, 850,000, uh, no, 85,000 student visa. We have a, a miles long queue at the Pudong International Airport. So, you know, students going back to the United States and, uh, and but, you know, uh, and, and yet uh, U.S. students can, student can come to China. So how can we really, you know, get this U.S. China working together on this pandemic fighting rather than we, uh, you know, point the finger and, 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 and shout at each other? Yeah, that's a great question. And, it, and it's a question I would ask on, on a number of major topics that, that affect the sustainability of life on earth for humans, including climate change, uh, food insecurity, everything health related, the pandemic is, kind of the most obvious and, and most pressing matter that you brought up. Um, but we, because of climate change, we have all kinds of natural disasters. How, how can we learn to either alter the course of this climate change so that, so that the earth will be, you know, be able to, to, to carry on for many more years beyond the current trajectory? Or it, so these are big issues. Um, and clearly the two largest economies in the world, as David pointed out in his opening comment, you know, have to work together. In fact, it's hard to imagine not solving these issues without the collaboration of China and the, in the United States. There's a, there's a clear mandate and necessity for all of us to share our common humanity in addressing these, these kinds of issues. And I agree with you, the frustration over the finger pointing, I mean, especially at the beginning of the outbreak, you know, we had a, I don't know, we had messaging coming out of the White House 
that said, oh, it's just going to be here for a little while. We have 13 cases. It's all going to go away and blah, blah, blah. And, oh, yeah, we're going to have a mask mandate, but I'm not going to wear a mask. And, you know, yeah, everybody should get vaccinated, but no, there's no there's no real push. And so there's a huge kind of anti-vax movement in the United States. We, 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 we don't have a national pride or national um, drive to combat this pandemic in a way that, that we as a nation could, but we should learn from one another. You know, we should be open-minded about looking at what New Zealand has done and what Australia has done, what China has done, what other countries have done. We should share the best technologies that exist for vaccine development and have manufacturers all over the world convert their manufacturing to, back, to vaccine manufacturing of qualified vaccines so that uh, the, the global population could be more readily vaccinated against this pandemic and the spread of it through the various variants. Um, you know, the drugs that, are, that, that can be administered, all of these kinds of things need to be, there needs to be more of an of a environment of collaboration, which sadly doesn't exist today. And I, I'm, I'm not, I'm convinced that, that you know, that things are, will change over time. I'm, I may be the only guy out there that says this, but I do believe that this administration you know, is already creating more opportunities for exchange and dialogue and that kind of thing. And inevitably, when you sit down and you have dialogue with with counterparts, good things come out of it. Better understanding and 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 um, you know, an addressing of serious issues. And the I, the topic of collaborating on the pandemic and and healthcare related issues in general should be should be front and center on on the table of, for discussion. Yeah, yeah, great. I, I think you, you, you mentioned those uh, very important issues and, uh, you know, we should really work together on this, uh, on this uh, uh, you know, uh, pandemic fighting, uh, vaccine <laughs> recognition and, uh, and, and also learn from each other. Absolutely. I mean, uh, we need a lot of cooperation in, 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 in combating the, the, the COVID-19. And actually, this could be a, a punishment of the, of the nature that we are not really respect the uh, sustainable and climate change it could you know so this is a huge lesson for us so so david yeah. what's your what's your what's your uh take on this well henry thank you and um uh, you know I, I i think neil has said it really well i i would just amplify one one point with respect to covid 19 and, and let me make a broader point to uh, at the outset um, absolutely, COVID-19 and pandemics generally and public global public health uh, even more broadly are areas where the United States and China should be collaborating because these are the very definition of the kinds of issues and they're not the only ones where no one country by definition can solve these problems. These problems require a collaboration from all the major players in the world and um, instead of thinking of COVID-19 here in the United States as a kind of wedge issue between the United States and China, we ought to be thinking of it, uh, just as Neil said, and Henry, as you said, as an opportunity for collaboration, not because it's a warm and fuzzy or altruistic thing to do, but because lives depend on our ability to collaborate. And uh, as I said in an interview a little over a year ago, in May or so of, of, of last year, you know, when a house is on fire, uh, the first thing you do is you say, who's in the house and how do we get them out? You don't say who started the fire. And yet we saw in the United States uh, this propensity to demonize China, to lambast uh, China and, and assume the absolute worst about its motivations. Uh, and um, what we really should have been talking about at that time was how do we save lives and how do we work together to bring as early an end to this pandemic as we possibly can. And with respect to this particular facet of the issue, I just want to say uh, here what, what uh, I and we, and we as a foundation have said emphatically many times, and that was that the, um, the, the racially charged and I would say racist rhetoric that emanated from President Trump and other senior members of the executive branch, the then Secretary of State, uh, Mr. Pompeo and members of Congress was despicable. It was repugnant, it was deplorable, and it was wrong. And it was far beneath the dignity of any office holder in this nation. Uh, it, is, uh, it is not how we should be communicating. The notion that people were using terms such as, quote, China virus or, quote, Chinese virus, or even worse, 
quote, Kung flu. This is a disgrace. This, is, this brings shame on our nation for any serious political figure uh, elected or appointed to use that kind of reprehensible language. And of course, as a result, and predictably, it drove uh, the numbers of, of uh, anti-Asian racist violence through the roof. And that is deplorable and absolutely um, uh, tragic. And so we as a foundation spoke out and continue to speak out about this. Um, you know, we've got to uh, get back to a, and I think we are now under this administration, a much more mature and less juvenile style of communication. Because when you start throwing around uh, these types of terms, uh, any possibility of collaboration goes out the door, even if there really are valuable areas where we ought to be collaborating. So the language matters, the communication matters, and boy, what I wouldn't give to have um, you know um, a, a way of thinking about communication and thinking about bringing people together uh, of the type that we saw under the presidency of George H. W. Bush. To his credit. President Joe Biden has um, gotten rid of that kind of language. He's banned it from the White House. He said he will fire people, for, and he's done it, for using language that is not uh, appropriate for the White House of our nation. And uh, I think we're getting back to some of the norms that were established uh, under many presidents. But uh, that is a really important part of the COVID piece. If we don't communicate in a mature and professional and serious and business-like way, any hope of, of collaboration that would benefit all of us uh, becomes very remote. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Thank you, uh, uh, Neil and, and David, for your very uh, open and frank and, uh, and very uh, positive uh, uh, discussion. I, I, I agree, I absolutely agree with you. I think that uh, uh, you know, we need to improve our communication uh, dialogues. And uh, I mean, the COVID-19 already uh, st uh, separated us. We, we can't have a face-to-face -face meetings. So we should really be careful of our languages and of our, 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 our you know, the discussion and in exchanges. I, I'm glad to see uh, President Biden, act, when he comes to the office, he actually signed an executive order banning the use of ethnic language refu refers to the, to the virus. Uh, uh, so that is a good, good sign. So, so we hope that uh, uh, things can, can get better. I, I know that uh, now we, we can talk a bit more on that, but you know, President Biden is already uh, over six months in the office, and uh, China and U.S. We had uh, quite a several rounds of uh, discussion. We had uh, uh, Alaska encounter and uh, and uh, with uh, uh, Secretary Blinken and, uh, and and China's senior diplomats. Of course, recently uh, we had uh, Deputy Secretary of State uh, 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 Wendy Sherman come to Tianjin. We had a second round of discussion and. Uh, so it seems, of course, a second time, I, I would say it's better than first time, <laughs> but still, uh, we, well, one of the best was actually, I think, uh, was uh, uh, former uh, Secretary of State, now Special Envoy, uh, John Kerry's visit uh, to, 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 to China on first time, and they issued uh, John to communicate on the climate uh, change uh, 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 between the collaboration. And again, uh, uh, John Kerry's plan to visit China in the next several weeks. I know that uh, also uh, John Fountain, the honorary chair of uh, Brookings, actually uh, currently is in China, and actually he met uh, uh, the Minister of uh, Environment and had a lot of uh, uh, constructive dialogues. So, so we hope you know we can really now facing those huge issues, facing those uh, uh, you know the more uh, challenges that U.S. and China can really uh, you know work together on those uh, uh, mostly critical issues to the mankind, uh, to the whole world, uh, to the, to the, to the same point five billion people, because the number two, number one and number two largest economy in the world have a moral responsibility to do that. So how can we really uh, improve on that? And, uh, and uh, so, so what do you think about uh, uh, where are the low hanging fruit? Can we start uh, uh, climate change so we can get some positive news? We can get some positive uh, uh, message across the countries. We can you know, now we have the student back, can we have a US student back to China? Or can we uh, have the consulate <laughs> resumed in both Houston and uh, where you, you, both of you are based in Texas and in China too? So things like that, uh, 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 probably uh, Neil, you, you can give some uh, 
uh, first. Uh, uh, you know, I'm actually. I'd, I think I may pass the buck over to David. I'm curious about his response on the on the student travel. You've mentioned that a couple of times. I mean, one of the one of the the, the great blessings of of connectivity is having so many thousands of students come to the United States every year to to you know it, it, we, we're a land of immigrants and I know these students aren't immigrating but we I, I just think it's wonderful how America you know has taken kind of the best of, of talent from all over the world they come to this part of the world they learn and go back to their countries or stay and help us build our economies and there's so, so much value to those student um, student experiences, both the U.S. students going to China and vice versa, come to Chinese students coming here. David, what is the, what's the prospect for for that that activity cranking back up again? Yeah, well, Neil, thank you, and and a couple of points in response to to Henry's really good questions. Um, one, first of all, with respect to students, uh, it is encouraging to see us get back toward. Um, something that looks more normal in terms of the flow of students and the flow of people within the constraints of COVID-19, which are significant, but at least we're moving back in the right direction. You know, there was a there was a 12 month uh, period where year over year, we actually saw, and I think it was from 2019 to, to mid 2020, um, we actually saw a literally 99% drop in US student visa issuance to Chinese students from, I think it was um, 80,000 to 800 approximately. That was the scale. At one point we, we, we issued 80,000 visas and then over the next 12 months we issued 800. Some of that obviously was COVID, but a lot of it was also just a very a fundamentally different view under the Trump administration about the value or what they would have regarded as the lack of value uh, in, in having students from China come to this country. What, what Neil, what you understand and what I understand, and I think what Henry understands, is that actually there's huge value in having students from all over the world come to this country and contribute to our research and development, contribute to uh, scholarship at universities, co uh, contribute to uh, the development of new ideas and innovation, new companies. And um, the notion that by turning off that spigot and shutting that down, that that's good for America is just about as dumb an idea uh, in terms of uh, the modern uh, 21st century economy as I can imagine. And so to see it move back toward uh, a more normal level, at least in terms of Chinese students coming to the United States, and I certainly hope we'll see an analogous uh, upward tick in U.S. students getting back to China once the overall health situation allows for that. Uh, these exchanges are great for our countries, and we need to increase them, not decrease them. Uh, I, just as a, a side note relative to um, Henry's question, in terms of what's the low-hanging fruit, in addition to getting student numbers back up, I think we need to get the Fulbright pro, uh, program back up and running again. We need to get other cultural and educational exchanges back up and running. We need to get the U.S. Peace Corps uh, uh, functioning in China again, assuming China still welcomes that. Yes, of course, Henry, you're right. We need to get the two consulates back up and running again. Uh, Neil and I both feel very strongly about that, and so many other Americans. We've got to, you know, we're, we're not helping anybody by shutting down the, the Chinese consulate general in Houston or the U.S. consulate general in Chengdu. It, it hinders both countries' abilities to provide services for citizens, to support business and trade and so forth and so on. So there are a number of things in that area. But Henry, the final point I would make uh, that I think is um, goes to your question is uh, there are areas that the Biden administration identified very early on as uh, areas that are fruitful uh, for and that are pot potentially very beneficial to both countries in terms of uh, collaboration. One is public health. We've talked about that. Uh, and let me also note, both China and the United States made some very serious mistakes in their early handling of COVID-19. There's no question about it. That being said, the question now is how do we actually make the situation better? So we've talked about COVID-19, but also the issue of um, uh, climate, uh, climate change, just as Neil noted uh, and Henry, as you noted at the outset, the issue of arms control, the issue of nuclear non-proliferation, including on the Korean uh, Peninsula, but not limited to that particular space. Now the issue of Afghanistan, the United States and China need to come together and talk about uh, this incredible uh, and tragic uh, situation that we now see in Afghanistan, 
And I think there's uh, much to discuss there. Uh, the question of Iran's nuclear ambitions and other issues, piracy on the high seas. There are a whole host of areas where it's in each country's interest to work together. And we just need to set emotions aside. Yes, we disagree with China. Uh, we as a nation disagree with China on any number of issues. And China disagrees with America. Yes, China does some things that are immensely problematic for America, no question. And America does some things that are very problematic for China. We have to set that aside, not in a clear-eyed way, and focus on where we can make a difference. And there are a lot of areas where we can, and that's what I hope we'll see over the coming years. Yes. Uh, yeah. Th thank you. Thank you, uh, David and Neil. I, I think absolutely. I mean, I, I agree with you. I think that uh, you know uh, both U.S. and China uh, being the two largest economy has a really uh, very strong responsibility and uh, 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 to work together. I mean, you're right. I mean, the the the, the you know the the issues, the chaotic situation in Afghanistan. Uh, where where is next? How can we really work together on that? Uh, should we really, you know, China, U.S., uh, and the country in the region should really work out a, a, a post-war plan, uh, uh, maybe for the peace and stability there? And uh, of course, there's the issue of Korea, North Korea, uh, Korea Peninsula, and there's issues of Iran, and uh, you know, China was one of the uh, talking parties there, and so there are many international issues. And but most, of, most, what's more important, I, I, I think that uh, uh, this this world economy is also need us to. Uh, to really uh, work together to to put it uh, up, uh, uh, also for the developing countries, for for Africa, for for uh, Latin America, for so many countries that we we really need to work together. So absolutely, we need to put aside our differences and maximize our, our common common uh, positions. Uh, so David, I actually I, I noticed that you actually in January this year when you uh, uh, talked at uh, the Hong Kong Forum that organized by. Uh, U.S. China Business Exchange Foundation. There, that uh, you talk about the way forward. You mentioned about six uh, uh, point there, which I, I think is really interesting. Uh, you, you said, of course, uh, we should reopen uh, two consulates in Houston and Chengdu, since you and Georgia uh, and Neil are both uh, are in Texas, where the the the, the consulate was located. I'm from Chengdu. I mean, I I really want to see uh, the consulate open there too, and also. Uh, the second recommendation said restore the Fulbright program, and third recommendation said restore the U.S. Peace Corps presence in China, and uh, and also the fourth recommendation is the United States uh, government should cease uh, uh, the de desist from its efforts in the shutdown Confucius Institute, and the number five is that more openness in trade and investment, uh, but also to people to pick exchanges. And, uh, and, and also six is to think about creating an international visitor leadership program. Uh, China to think, uh, you know, uh, creating this program to uh, between the South and the South Americans and Chinese and in both directions. So, so you're right, because you are one of the early uh, scholars come to China, you, you can read it as first hand. So, so for, for those things, uh, you know, plus the climate change, I mean, can we really do more? Uh, uh, and also we can elaborate on those points that very good point you made. Well, Henry, thank you so much for noting that. And, and let me just say, um, you know, I, I think there are, uh, there, we, we are facing a very turbulent and contentious and difficult and challenging time in the relationship right now. It is going to be very difficult to do big things uh, at this moment because of the tenor of the rhetoric and the mindset in Washington. And for that matter, you know, you sometimes hear some heated rhetoric from the Chinese side, et cetera. And so there's a lot of tension there. But so the question becomes, what can be done? And the things that you noted that I had talked about earlier this year, and some of which I mentioned uh, in this uh, uh, discussion, are things that are actually doable. They're, they're not things that are really that controversial. They're not things that are that difficult to do. Most of them can be done uh, with a presidential um, executive directive um, and or executive order rather. Uh, as they were, you know, in many cases, undone by Trump with an executive order, so can they be restored by the same uh, mechanism? And so you're not talking about new uh, legislation, which would be a very, you know, very difficult thing to achieve in this environment. Um, and so all of those things, I think, are just uh, I propose that we do them not because they're good for China, 
but because they're good for America. And yes, they're also good for the relationship and they can serve as confidence building measures that can get these two countries uh, back, moving back in a direction where we're actually um, speaking to each other in a business-like way and focusing on solving problems. Um, the one thing I would amplify, Henry, from the, the kind of list that you just mentioned <clears throat> of proposals I had made earlier in the year is I do think China, uh, this issue of what I referred to as the International Visitor Leadership Program or IVLP, uh, that is a program that exists in the United States whereby many thousands of foreign citizens come to the United States at the expense of the American government, the federal uh, government and the US taxpayer and they come and spend two or three weeks, it used to be four weeks in the United States, and they learn about this country firsthand by traveling across the country, meeting people, and learning about America, as we would say, warts and all, not just propaganda, but hey, here's the things we're doing well, here's the things we're not doing well, and going back with a better and more textured understanding uh, to their country of the United States. I think if China were to do something like that, it would be very beneficial because not all, but many of the sharp, uh, the harshest critics of China in the United States have never been in China or never lived in China. Unlike Neil, unlike me, and unlike many others, they haven't actually interacted with Chinese people at a human level in many, many cases. And so um, they don't necessarily have the their fingers on the pulse of what's happening in that country in the same way. And so um, I, I think China would be well served to create what I've called and what the US government calls an international visitor leadership program and literally bring thousands or even tens of thousands of Americans to China uh, every year uh, in the way that the United States brings foreign citizens, including Chinese to the United States and, and help Americans, more Americans get a much better understanding of the real China, warts and all, the good things, the, the bad things, the things we agree with, the things we disagree with, because that foundation of understanding can lead to some really good things. And I, I think China under invests in, um, in people to people exchanges of this type. And I think China would be well served to invest more. Uh, and, and frankly, the United States would be well served to invest more as well. We need it more than ever uh, during this very challenging period in US-China relations. Yeah, yeah, absolutely, I agree. <laughs> I think that you, you know, we hope that we can restore the Fulbright program uh, from the U.S. But, but particularly, you, you, you make a very good recommendation that China probably should set up an uh, international visitor leadership program that we can have, uh, like U.S. did in the past, and we can bring uh, hundreds and thousands of, uh, of U.S. Uh, leaders and things like that to, uh, to, to visit China and, uh, and also to understand China, because seeing is believing. And, uh, and uh, uh, you know, when people come and then really interact and uh, have this human touch and human bond uh, that would greatly change many things uh, uh, going forward. As a matter of fact, uh, CCG, we, we recently did uh, uh, launch the uh, International uh, Young Leaders Dialogue Program uh, together with a, a, a partner. And uh, actually that program, we, we are not able to attract people from outside China, but we're doing the, for, you know, uh, those international young talents already in China, that, that was really going on very well. We had a six troop, uh, organized six trips, uh, visited six provinces, uh, over 100 of them, and among 30 of them actually wrote, uh, wrote to President Xi and the President Xi replied to them. And uh, it was really encouraging this kind of a move and hope to bring more people uh, to, to come to China, to, to, to visit China and see the real China. So I think your, your, your suggestion is just uh, very timely and uh, I'm sure you know this could be a very good uh, recommendations. Uh, so, so now Neil, I, I would like to uh, uh, ask a question for you as well. And uh, you're based in Texas. We know Texas uh, is uh, is uh, really abundant for the energy. Uh, uh, you know, the energy cooperation between China and the U.S. is uh, is one of the big big area. I remember when uh, when President uh, Trump came to China in 2017, he signed over 250 billion. Uh, dollar, uh, you know, uh, various deals, and a big chunk of that is energy deal, and uh, you know, uh, from uh, Texas, from Alaska. Uh, so, so we, we see, uh, you know, before he started the uh, trade war, we see a lot of cooperations uh, uh, going on, then. and uh, and also, of course, I, I I did some study there, and because if you want to uh, import the energy or, or uh, whether 
shale gas or, or LNG from the inland of Texas to the port and then port to China. The cost from inland to the Texas port is double the tax port to China. So there's lack of infrastructure uh, in, the, in the taxes uh, in, in really, uh, you know, export to China. And actually China could, uh, companies could help on that, on those infrastructure, could JV with US companies to do that. So that's one area. The other area is also Texas is a great uh, center for, for US in the airspace and, uh, uh, and aviation and, and, you know, things like that. And there could be potential for, for China and US to collaborate on, a, on uh, in our aerospace. We see now the, the famous businessman now flying uh, <laughs> out of space. I mean, I remember they are saying, when they look out from uh, uh, the, the space, look at the earth, we are really one, you know, we are one, <laughs> one village, one, uh, one human being raised uh, uh, in a nest. How can we really fight each other? So, so probably now from those point, of, you know, in addition to uh, consulate and other things, the area can collaborate, uh, you know, like uh, from, from a Texas point of view and uh, or US in that matter. Uh, what are those yes. areas? I mean, uh, maybe, you know, further, further to promote that. Um, first of all, I'm going to reflect back on David's comment about comparative advantage. The trade is really about comparative advantage. Um, and one of the great advantages that Texas has uh, and that the United States up until recently has had is that we've had a surplus of, of oil production and natural gas production. And, and, and it, it, you know, I'm not, I can't speak to the infrastructure issues and the cost of transport from West Texas, from the, from the Permian Basin to the coast of Texas and then shipping it around. Um, but to the extent that there's a demand in China for the, these products and to the extent that we can provide the supply to meet that demand at a cost, at a, on a cost reasonable basis, we should engage in that trade, period. It's just as simple as that. And the trade trade deficit will be reduced by it, which is, I really don't care about the trade deficit, but it's just a fact <laughs> that it would be reduced yeah. and some politicians will be able to brag about how they brought the trade deficit down. Um, so yeah, there's there's clearly, a, and, I lo and I love your suggestion that, that we should be very open to having you know, joint venture collaboration, you know, invest in uh, infra investment in infrastructure by Chinese and joint ventures with American companies to get to, to, you know, get access to these supplies makes total sense to me. Um, you mentioned aerospace. The, the, the Bush China Foundation has been a co-sponsor of a of an event that's happened three years in a row called the um, the uh, International Symposium for the Peaceful Use of Space Te Technology with a focus on health. Um, and, and this um, organization has brought together uh, leading space-related agencies and organizations from around the world, from, from Europe, France, and, and um, Germany, from Japan and Russia, the United States. Um, and it's been pretty remarkable. The last couple of sessions have been in-person in China, but virtual for all those outside of China. Um, and, and it's, but the first one that was held in Hainan Island was very successful in bringing people together. And yeah, I'm not sure about the privatization of space and how th that, because there's going to be, a, there's going to be competition, you know, to get out there to try to attract customers, you know, to make the, make the economics of space travel for tourists, you know, competitive. But there's all kinds of science that can be gleaned from and, and gleaned from space related work. Um, and that's the kind of science that's going to benef benefit humankind. And, and to the extent that China brings something of value to, to that exploration and we bring something of value and the Europeans bring something, we should collaborate, no doubt about it. Yeah. Absolutely.